This is the story about one of Spain's most notorious criminals. He started off small and grew to become a kingpin with direct ties to the Medellin cartel. With his money, he bought mansions, yachts, and even his own football club. In Spain, he is known as the Pablo Escobar of Galicia and was police enemy number one. His story is so interesting that even Netflix dedicated an entire series to him. Let's immediately dive into it. José Ramón Prado Bugalo, also known as Cito Miñanco, was born in 1955 in Cambados, Spain, a small city with just 13,000 inhabitants. In the 70s, young Cito smuggled millions worth of tobacco into Galicia, a region in the northwest of Spain. During the dictatorship that lasted until 1978, only state-owned tobacco was allowed to be sold, which was more expensive. A lot of people smoked around that time. Cito getting them tobacco for a cheaper price was seen as a good thing rather than something illegal. All tobacco was smuggled via sea. Cito knew the sea by heart, coming from a family of fishermen, and used it to his advantage to become a very successful smuggler. Despite his incredible skills, Cito got incarcerated in 1983 for smuggling. While doing time, he came into contact with a prominent Colombian drug lord of the Medellin cartel, called Jorge Luis Ochoa. We all know Pablo Escobar was a member of the Medellin cartel as well. This connection opened a whole new world for Cito, as smuggling cocaine was much more lucrative than tobacco. With this direct link to arguably at the time one of the biggest players, Cito was presented with a golden opportunity. Once released from prison, he immediately went to work. Cito frequently visited Panama. Here is where he would fall in love with Odalis Rivera, the niece of Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. At the time, Panama was used by Escobar and the rest of the Medellin cartel as a place to store some of their ill-gotten gains and produce large quantities of coke. Cito now had two great connections in Colombia and Panama that would establish his global cocaine pipeline to the Spanish Galician region. As money started pouring in, Cito started to act the same way as Pablo Escobar did in Colombia. He was extremely generous to people everywhere he went. Needed some money for groceries? No problem. He also decided to take ownership in a football team. In 1986, it was not some big name club in Spain such as Barcelona or Madrid. No, something closer to home. He started investing in the club of his hometown in Cambados, called the Juventud Cambados. Cito bought the best players in the region to play for his team and in a short period of time, the team rose through the Spanish divisions. By 1989, Cambados was playing in the Segunda División B. Coaches and players were paid in suitcases full of cash. Cito often invited them on his yacht and took the team on trips to Panama. When there was a renovation needed to the old stadium, Cito did not mind to pay for it. Thanks to his cash, the stadium was fully renovated and upgraded to hold 2,000 more seats. No one in the small village asked questions, and the police had no idea. They just thought he was a successful businessman with a big heart for his hometown club. Some knew Cito had served a sentence for smuggling, but no one had a clue he had become a big player in the coke game. In 1990, Cito was at the top of his career. His money seemed endless and life was great. Shipment after shipment went successful, but you know what they say, right? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Cito's flashy life started to attract the eyes of law enforcement and Spanish prosecutor Baltazar Garçon decided to go after Cito and his organization. With success, it led to the arrest of several people from his organization. Allegedly, one of them snitched and Cito was caught not much later in one of his mansions. He was prosecuted for smuggling 2.5 tons of coke and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Luckily for him, he was released early after doing just seven years in 1997. He immediately went back to work. However, by now, all eyes were on him. His moves were carefully observed and he got arrested again not much later for orchestrating a large shipment of 6,000 kilos of hashish. After serving that sentence, he was released in 2004. Sito, once again, immediately got back to work. I think you can already feel it coming. He was arrested, again, this time for a busted shipment of 5,000 kilos of coke that was seized in French Guyana and for being the head of a criminal organization. This time around, he was sentenced to nearly 17 years in prison 
and an extraordinary fine of an estimated 400 million pesetas. Despite being in and out of prison, Sito never talked. He always accepted his sentence, did the time, and came back out ready to go again. He just could not seem to escape the pressure of the Spanish prosecutors, which led him to constantly being observed and ultimately arrested. What he did do was bribe the prison officer at the prison he was staying at, which was unveiled in 2011. Sito gave him two brand new Mercedes cars in exchange for a more lenient and favorable treatment inside the jail. At the end of 2014, Sito was released early once again due to good behavior. Just like the previous times, he went right into the underworld again. With the eyes of law enforcement tracking his every move, he was seen multiple times at a shipbuilder. Back in his days, Sito always used so-called narcolanchas, a fast speedboat with a flat bottom that could carry large quantities of drugs. Because of the flat bottom, these boats could easily propel themselves tens of meters over the sand ashore. This time, Sito ordered several narcolanchas, worth 700,000 euros, and equipped them with GPS trackers and communication devices. He then installed antennas on various mountains in Galicia to create his own communication network. Lastly, he set up a counter-observation team to keep an eye on potential police following him. I guess he finally learned something from last time. Around the same time, Sito frequently met up with two Dutch men, Ronald S. and Martin G. It is unclear how they all exactly met, but the two Dutch men also lived in Spain. They gave a large quantity of PGP phones to Sito, which were from a Dutch PGP provider. Sito wanted to become partners with Dutch people in order to gain access to the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam. Raymond van Aar, another Dutchman, was responsible for designing trafficking routes from the Netherlands to Spain for Sito's organization. Together, they brought in large shipments of coke. What they did not know is that the 1st of October 2017, Operación Mito started, another operation set up to catch Sito. On the same day, Spanish customs raided a cargo ship that was headed to Turkey. In the storage room, they found 3,800 kilos of coke, worth 100 million euros. In the area, two boats were floating on the sea that suddenly sped off. Upon further investigation, it was determined that these were Sito's narcolanchas. Shipment failed. Law enforcement, however, did not arrest Sito just yet. On the 10th of November 2017, several raids took place in the Netherlands. 16 million euros worth of coke was seized, the biggest seizure ever in The Hague. PGP messages have revealed that this caused Sito a lot of stress. Another big seizure, just a month later. The Colombians were knocking on his door and so were the police. In February 2018, Operación Mito came to a successful end. All throughout Spain, 43 men were arrested, including Sito himself. Without putting up a fight, he was arrested. According to the judge, he even made a joke while put inside the police van. Do you think Real Madrid has a chance this week? He asked the policeman. Eventually, he was prosecuted for money laundering, smuggling a shipment worth 3,800 kilos and one of 615 kilos, as well as being the leader of a criminal organization. Once in jail, he started a hunger strike because he was treated poorly. I guess he could not bribe anyone with a brand new Mercedes this time. For now, he's back behind bars. José Ramón Prado Bugalo, better known as Sito Minyanko, has lived a very turbulent life. From his humble beginnings to becoming a top kingpin and owning his own football club, to spending the majority of his time in jail, would you say he was a successful kingpin? Let me know in the comments, and I really hope to see you in the next one.